Hello! I thought I'd bring you a progress update on the Mr. Floppy project, the project I'm working on that brings real floppy disks to the Mr. Minimig core. In the last video, I showed some success with games booting, but there were a few problems, so in this video, I'll try to bring you up to date. One big change for me was solving the slow select line issue. Consider this floppy drive. The select signal is used to tell the drive you want to control it. The operating system can expect the drive to respond and accept input within around 0.5 microseconds, a very short amount of time. In a previous video, I explained a little about the limitations of the user port on the MISTER, and as a result, I was forced to use a port expander to get the required number of signals. The problem with this is that it typically takes around 70 microseconds to change any of those pins. That's 150 times slower which is a long time when the operating system thinks it can work with the drive almost instantly, only to find it can't. This could potentially cause issues in a few areas. For example, reading data, as it won't be available for the first 70 microseconds. That's less of a problem, however. Consider writing to a disk. The first 70 microseconds of data might not get written at all. Turns out these are very easy to fix. The majority of disk reading and writing on the Amiga are performed using DMA, and the Minimig core already has an implementation of this or it wouldn't even load ADFs. Each time a word, that's two bytes of data, is read from the disk, valid or not, it's sent to a small buffer for DMA transfer. So, for reading, it's simple, I can hold that off until the drive select command is ready. Same goes for writing, I don't start reading the data until the drive's ready to be written to. The amazing side effect of this is it also fixes the multiple drive issue. This is Xcopy copying from one real disk to another. This was all fine until I tried to copy from an ADF loaded into drive DF0 and copy that to a real DF1. Nothing would verify and this baffled me for ages as it didn't make any sense. I couldn't work out if the hardware or software was causing the problem. Probably a strange way to diagnose this, I started by looking at the data that was being written to the drive. Firstly, the physical signals coming from the MISTER to the drive. Something looked very wrong here. Firstly, these transitions here were too close together for a double density disk. There should be about double that. Then there's this huge gap here, that's totally wrong. I needed to find out where this was coming from. And lucky for me, I've been watching the Twitch streams by Hoffman. Recently, he's been showing what an action replay cartridge can do on the Amiga. I then remembered that the Mr. Core came with HRT Mon, which is kind of like the Action Replay. Using it, I was able to take a look at the MFM buffer currently actively being transferred via DMA to the disk, and I instantly knew that was wrong. For starters, there really shouldn't be any Fs in that data, which accounted for those really large gaps between pulses. There's also sections of all zeros that would place MFM bits right next to each other, which isn't allowed. This would account for those two microsecond pulses we saw. And this has to be coming from the ADF code somewhere. Taking a look at the code in the Mr. Main, I understood why. The MFM spec requires clock bits to be inserted into the data. Once read back, they're not needed anymore. It turns out, because they're discarded, there hadn't been any point in generating them, until now. So I modified this code to generate the required clock bits. And now I was able to do some more crazy things. Here I have an ADF mounted in drive DF0 and I'm copying it to two real drives configured as DF1 and DF2. But there's been other progress too. Thanks to my amazing testing team who each received a prototype board, they quickly discovered something I hadn't even tried. Nothing booted or worked at all on Kickstart 1.3. This puzzled me for ages as I couldn't understand why it would be any different. I knew that the track disk device, which is used to read and write disks, was completely rewritten in Kickstart 2, so something must have changed. I had a chat with Keir Fraser, hoping to gain some insight from his experience, and he gave me a hint. Normally, as I've shown in this video, to read a track from a disk, you ask Paula to start sending data when it encounters a sync word. I'm sure you've all seen 4489 written a few times. That's the standard sync word. Well, it turns out on Kickstart 1.3, for some reason, they didn't use this ability of Paula at all. Instead, they chose to do this in software. My only guess as to why they did this was maybe that the track disk device code was written before a final working version of Paula existed. Anyway, the reason this broke the sync word code I had, kindly provided to me, was because it didn't switch off when it wasn't supposed to be in use. This caused the data stream to become corrupted. I also discovered another bug in my code, which was triggered when the activity light was enabled on the board. Once this light changed state, anything I read back from the port expander was incorrect, causing the drive to behave erratically until it was told to do something different. This bug had been in there from the start, and now that it's fixed, disks load a lot faster. I might change the purpose of this LED in future revisions to show the board is working and have the drive LEDs connected in a different way. 
but it's still not working perfectly yet. Well, for me it seems to be working flawlessly, however, some of my testers seem to be having some issues. I'm currently doing all my testing on the Mr. Multi system, and it's great, but my testers aren't. So my next step is to assemble a standard Mr. Stack to perform some more testing. I suspect the issues now are mainly to do with electrical or signal issues, much like anyone who's had any issues trying to get the MT32Pi to work. I'm sure you'll have seen the list of working cables versus non-working cables, for example. Once I've got this set up, I will check it again and then revise the hardware. I'm also going to switch this type of connector to a Type A, so it can share the same set of cables as the MT32Pi does. Oh, and do you like my new case? This one has two slimline floppy drives in it. I'll probably end up building some adapter boards like this to allow you to do this. Anyway, while that's all going on with the hardware, I'm going to start looking at adding IPF and SCP support to the core too. And because of the work I've already done, some of the work required to decode the disks in real time is already there. So it should just be a matter of providing that data directly and correctly rather than via the floppy drive. I hope you found this update useful. I don't have any kind of release dates yet, so you'll just have to watch this space. Until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.